Um, so this is the best practices for choosing games or topics um, for episodes, for podcasts. Um, uh, and uh, we'll start off with a series of uh, introductions uh, to members of the panel. Um, so uh, we're a group of game studies scholars who enjoy talking about games. Um, I'm going to be the moderator. My name is Jason Boyd. I'm an associate professor of English at Toronto Metropolitan University in Toronto, Canada. Um, I'm the director of the Centre for Digital Humanities there. Um, I'm also an affiliated member of the um, Master's for Digital Media Program and the joint TMU York University Graduate Program in Communication and Culture. And I'll turn it over to um, Tanya to introduce herself. Sure. Themselves. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a member of the Center for Digital Humanities. I'm very proud of that. Uh, I used to actually be a, a games journalist, and then I went into the games industry on the comm side and, and repped such products as... Uh, Monster Truck Madness and uh, and Flight Simulator, very very fun fact, and uh, and now I I decided to do a PhD later in life, and uh, I get to do all kinds of weird and wonderful things, uh, and I'm currently an online instructor at several Ontario colleges. All right, uh, Chelsea. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Chelsea, and I'm a PhD candidate at the program that Jason was talking about. So it's in the joint program between uh, Toronto Metropolitan and New York U. Um, I like to study robots and video games. That's typically what I like to do. I'm a nerd in all respects, though, and <laughs> um, like play magic on weekends and stuff like that. But I love video games. I love nerd culture. Yeah. Uh, Patrick. Hey, I'm Patrick Ardolan. I'm a newly newly minted doctor from uh, York and TMU, um, and I'm I guess currently an uh, independent researcher and interested in pixel graphics, low poly counts, and DIY gaming. And Jeremy. And hi everyone. Um, I uh, my name is Jeremy Andriano. And I'm a master's candidate in the uh, joint program in communication and culture at TMU and York universities here in Toronto, uh, Ontario. And um, my research focuses at the moment on, um, well, specifically on, on Twine and Inky and uh, comparing them as tools for introducing um, hypertext and other forms of interactive writing outside of the game development and computer science and digital media classrooms and into traditional uh, creative writing programs for secondary and undergraduate um, novice writers. And, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm always excited to talk about uh, video games and uh, podcasting about video games. And uh, we'll get into all of that as we go on. Great. All right. So, um, so um, we're going to start off with just with a brief description of um, the podcast that we're all on. Um, the unarchived podcast and the associated project the playable stories archive uh, so the playable stories archive um, is a curated guide for teachers and researchers who are interested in incorporating interactive digital stories in post-secondary curricula uh, and scholarship the playable stories archive features games and interactive media that, that have um, a a compelling narrative um, experience b that are not overly long C, that can be successfully navigated people by people with a wide range of abilities. Uh, D, that are available on multiple operating systems and platforms. And E, that are affordable. So now in its third season, the Playable Stories Unarchived podcast um, covers games that offer compelling narrative experiences, but that do not otherwise fit the criteria of the Playable Stories Archive. So games that are too long, too difficult, too platform excuse, exclusive, um, and too expensive. So the Unarchived podcast provides an opportunity to discuss these unsuitable games in order to broaden the knowledge of teachers and students and scholars about how storytelling in video games is used to delight, move, persuade, um, and educate. So episodes um, in the uh, Playable Stories Unarchived uh, podcast consist of a panel, like this one, usually between three and five people, including a host who usually doubles as the writer of the script for the episode, uh, engaging in a dialogue about a range of topics about the game that is the focus of the episode. So before talking about how we choose games for episodes, um, I think it's helpful to give our audience um, an idea of our, our ludic range as game players. Um, so what kinds of uh, games do you normally like to play? Um, uh, and what kinds of games do you normally avoid? And uh, let's go in reverse order and start with Jeremy. Hi, 
Um, yeah, I, I'm sort of a, a I'm I'm quite a dilettante, I guess, as far as as games go, and I can you know usually at least speak about um, even areas of gaming that I don't particularly play. But things I've been playing a lot lately, especially as graduate studies have intensified, I, I've been falling further and further back on like older model games, single play experience games. Um, arcade-like experiences uh, you'll hear me talk about this again but that leads to you know the newer trend of of roguelikes which is actually a throwback to a very old again single play experience kind of game and i i think about it a lot and i think it's because it, it's a lot of games have massive time commitments these days uh, especially the bigger narrative ones you can live in these worlds and and most graduate students don't have time for that i don't have the the psychic capacity to invest in a second life right now. So these little five to 10 minute experiences have, have been the best. And uh, there's been some neat developments in in throwing back to old arcade style games recently too. Patrick? Hey, yeah. Um, I would say, yeah, on the big end, I really like open world action adventure games like Death Stranding, Red Dead Redemption 2. On the lower, small, I guess smaller end, I, I really love um just like busting through like an hour two hour like low poly low budget walking sim um and recently i've been uh getting pretty heavily into racing games which is uh something i've never really played much um before um i tend to avoid puzzle games and like strategy games right uh chelsea um, so I usually actually gravitate to two ends of the gaming spectrum. On one hand, I have a really deep love for horror games that offer that kind of like intense, high stakes experience. So I really love games like Dead by Daylight, Phasmophobia, Texas Chainsaw. And those games, I think, really like bring together that multi multiplicity of experience, right? Creating those really interesting, unique storytelling moments. Um, but on the other hand, I find comfort in cozy games. Um so they present like a gentler, I guess, escape from reality. Uh, titles like Animal Crossing, Pokemon, Moonstone Island. Um, so rooted in exploration, uh, peaceful gameplay looping. Uh, so, and while I appreciate a broad range of games, I'm sorry, Patrick, I really avoid sports and racing games. <laughs> I find they lack that kind of narrative complexity that draws me in, unless it's Mario Kart uh, that I can play or Mario Tennis. For some reason, <laughs> Mario gets a special a special uh, ability to hold me. Uh, Tanya? Yeah, absolutely. I, I cut my teeth uh, early in my career on things like Doom. We we crashed our uh, our networks and Quake and Unreal Tournament. And that was a huge part of my early uh, gaming lifestyle. And then I, you know, progressed to things like Borderlands, uh, Fallout. Because I'm a terrible parent, I would shoo my daughter out of the room, obviously. But when I was playing Fallout uh, 3, uh, I've been recently playing Starfield, but I've had to stop because I am far too busy as, you know, an academic and part-time uh instructor and yeah it's and i do actually like uh only one uh well, actually well i guess two uh a super mario kart and uh split second which was a game that commercially busted and particularly the the um if anyone has ever played the demo of split second the racing mm. game uh, and you're absolutely right chelsea i don't normally love uh racing games but split second makes everything into a movie Ooh, and I there's a little it bit a of a it's it's a ridiculous game. Uh, Disney, Disney uh, it was a produced by Disney, and it's a fantastic uh, over the top racing uh, game. And I completely agree with you, uh, Chelsea, that I don't overly love um, racing games, but that's a good one. So. Yeah, and unlike Patrick, I I really do like puzzle and strategy games, and um, <laughs> I don't like horror games, and I don't like platform games or anything like that. So, so um, we have a, a quite a diversity of different types of you know um, interests um, I, on the on the team of the uh, podcast that that leads for some some interesting proposals for games and some certain challenges when it comes to um, deciding on um, you know which games we want to feature in our podcast episodes. Um, so. So um, um, I thought that we'd uh, speak a bit about our process for choosing games for podcast episodes, like how we've been doing it. And uh, and Jeremy has volunteered to um, explain how, how we go about doing that. Sure. Yeah, I can talk about this. And it is overall, a, it's a pretty organic process, but it's one that we've, I, I feel like there has been some refine, refinement over the last three seasons of this show. Mm. 
and I hope that this can be generalized to, to, you know, any topic or, you know, to, to any, any scoped podcast. I hope this is helpful. Um, but basically, you know, we, we, we have a team of, it ranges between, you know, five and 10 people uh, from semester to semester. And we just keep a running list of nominations though. It currently has 10 on the list. Um, you know, it's just a, a open Google doc that anybody can propose a game to, they affix their name to it and maybe a few words of why they think it would be interesting to talk about on the show. And then you just kind of, you watch and some games, um, people just jump on right away and, and other times, you know, something doesn't gain any interest in this. This is where it can be sort of organic, where if the, the person who nominated it really wants to go to bat for it, you know, there's a good possibility that people just haven't had time to play everything so they can, you know, sort of campaign and say, Hey, check this out. I think you'd find this interesting. And, you know, people either pick it up or, or they don't. And I think, you know, this works for us. We keep a very reasonable schedule and scope for this project based on the fact that it is uh, an education pro project and um, an extracurricular for most of us. So we've fallen into this rhythm where we put out three episodes per semester, plus uh, we've had a, did a bigger episode this past summer, and I, I hope that tradition continues. So with a seven-episode season, keeping a running list of just 10 topic ideas, it's actually quite forward thinking, and that gives a lot of time for thoughts to matriculate uh, and and for things to be picked up. So, you know, again, it, it this could work for anything um, ranging from any academic topic. People sort of nominate things, let people think and stew about it. And then ultimately, um, as you get down to the semester, it's usually good to, you know, we know what's going to happen in October, November, and December, and then we've got a decent idea of next year and it, 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 it allows things to be planned out. Um, you know, scheduling tends to happen based on who's available. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, whoever nominated it might not, might not be a good month for them. So the game gets pushed or gets moved up. And of course you can pick thematic things for our specific case. You know, we can pick spooky games for October or dating Sims for, for Valentine's day for, for February and such. Um, but other than that, that's, um, that, that is a process. I hope I've, I hope that you know, there, there's some steps and some forethought that goes into that. Yeah, um, I think, you know, the, the major point there is it's really a kind of organic and negotiation, right? Um, there's not someone who basically is the person saying these are the games we're going to do. It's it's something we have to kind of get all, um, you know, a, a critical mass of team members together so that we can produce an episode. So, um, so one of the questions we wanted to talk about um, is like given the different uh, tastes in games, that we have, um, that we've uh, tried to uh, gesture to, um, and of course the many demands on uh, team members this time. Um, how do we persuade other team members that a game that we've proposed uh, is suitable or worthy of an episode and that they should sign up? Um, and I thought uh, we we had discussed this uh, beforehand and we thought that we would kind of stage a sort of um, example discussion about a particular game. Uh, there's been one game that's been sitting on the books for a while that Jeremy has proposed uh, um, called uh, Returnal, um, which is um, a 2021 roguelike third-person shooter where the player character is an astronaut who finds herself trapped in a time loop. So, um, so Jeremy, did you want to kind of uh, pitch uh, Returnal to us? <laughs> yeah. So I can just I can. This is a great example of uh, this organic process because in this case, you know, I think me as the person who brought the game forward. The percolation time allowed my feelings to change about it too. And we'll hear like, you know, from some of the other, I think, I feel like um, I've gone back and forth on this myself and other people have, have decided to champion it. Uh, so yes, <laughs> re re Returnal, um, it, it, this happened like most things go, you know, this is the kind of game I was playing at the time. It, uh, I, I kind of went into it blind um, and I'm not sure how many people here are very, as far as the listeners in this panel are interested in games, but it's a really arcade action-y, uh, just kind of mindless shooter that uh, is with high production values that you play as uh, Celine. Um, she's an astronaut in some kind of sci-fi sci future. And like most arcade uh, experiences, you know, you, the game ends rather quickly. It's very difficult. Things shoot at you. You can't move more quickly enough and, and then you die. But what made this game stand out and this kind of speaks to... Um, 
I think a wider storytelling thing, which is, this is what brought me to nominate it to the group. I was like, this is a roguelike that tells a compelling story. And other games have done this similarly, but not as well. I feel like where this is, this is the narrative, this character dies repeatedly, wakes up, doesn't know what's going on. She keeps finding different clues that kind of make her understand what happened to keep her trapped in this uh, cycle of just, you know, facing this terrifying planet, dying in different ways, learning something and going back and trying again. Um, it all seemed fantastic to me. And as I was getting into it, you know, I, I just, the notes were compiling about how this is a new form of storytelling. And, and, and then I got stuck and <laughs> we'll talk about this <laughs> later, but then I started to think, is this story? Yeah, I can, I'm going to leave this and let some of the other team kind of jump in, but I had this whole pitch presented as things I've been talking about that, you know, arcade games were not meant to tell stories. Galaga didn't have a story. Ms. Pac-Man kind of had a story. <laughs> <laughs> and and barely. Uh, so this isn't a genre. This is not a medium that was intended to be narrative. But now, you know, technology and other things have made it possible. This this was my pitch that now it is possible to tell stories like this. I may need to be convinced of this now, but I'll, I'll let the team come up <laughs> from here. Um, I can defend it since you're kind of uh, wavering. I mean, like what? If, so I'm not great at roguelikes, but what I uh, I've played a bit of Returnal, and what I what I think is quite interesting about it is that idea of like having this very compelling narrative because like we're talking mostly about narratives, but there's so much kind of like behind like kind of uh, I guess holding up Returnal um, that makes it really interesting. For one thing, it's like a it's a very close to a launch game of the PS5. It was like supposed to be a big PS5 game that. I think had like middling response. So that's really interesting. It comes from the developer's house mark that make like shoot 'em ups, bullet hells. And they made a very like retro style kind of like modern retro chic shoot 'em up game straight up. And then this is their big kind of like triple A, more realistic graphics. Um, this is also like an opportunity that brings sort of these bullet hell mechanics that are quite quite challenging, but quite deep, quite interesting, nuanced, brings it to kind of like the mainstream, which is like a really interesting way to talk about how that works into the narrative. Again, like talking about Jeremy's combination of arcade and narrative is this, this stands as a very interesting example of that because it comes from developers that have worked primarily on arcade stuff and have made this really kind of compelling compelling sort of like narrative that feels kind of in the same sort of, I guess, like, um, like kind of vibe space is control or something like that. Like one of these weird narrative games. Um, uh, yeah. So that's, that's my pitch for it. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? So uh, we discussed this and I am too poor to buy a <laughs> PS5 because I'm a contract academic. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a consideration that, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about uh, just in the sense that, you know, I can't even buy into that ecosystem yet. And I think I'm, I'm not gonna, because at this point they're already going to the next generation, but yeah, it, it's a, it's a great example of a game that's perfect for the podcast because it's, um, you know, it is, it is inaccessible for, for a lot of folks, students and, and instructors alike. So it's a, it's a really good one. It's just not one I'm going to be able to, join in on Chelsea yeah so I love roguelike games I've played them a lot and so I'm I guess a little biased for the pro side of things I think even talking about it from a perspective of like the mechanics of becoming more than a gameplay loop right like instead it becomes like a narrative device is really interesting right because it reflects like that sort of also psychological like struggle of the main character um, as she like confronts that never ending cycle of trauma, discovery, things like that. So I think Returnal has a really interesting fertile ground for exploring like how repetition shapes player engagement and how players, the act of repeating it or the same 
challenges or areas, um, but with like a different experience each time reveals new story fragments and insights. That's really new, I think, to roguelike games. I played a lot of like Binding of Isaac, Pixel Dungeon and games like that, which uh, the story was mostly the same throughout. You could find little new pieces of information, but the story at the end was the same. And so instead of that, this layered sort of storytelling mechanic with this unique relationship between the player and narrative, I think would make for a really interesting podcast like I said even just on the mechanics of the game itself like the commentary on the gameplay loop as a narrative device I think really interesting mm -hmm. um, although I can see um, how that emphasis on replayability can also detract from people wanting to play it and how that repetition can dilute your sort of like emotional ability to play it uh, when a game's narrative is built around linear progression or climactic moments um, the need to continuously replay that or master content can kind of create that like disconnect, reduce that sense of urgency. And so I can see uh, sides for both, although I'm pretty heavily on the side for playing it, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, I, I, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, sorry, ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead, Jason, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, I think I always find time loops to be really interesting in terms of narratives, right? Because they, they, they can be very challenging to to really do well. Um, but, you know, I, I I just, I have an objection to first person shooters and shooting games in general. So I usually will not, it, it would take a lot of persuasion to get me to play any game that is a first person shooter. You know, Void Bastards is another game that does a really interesting <laughs> thing with roguelites, uh, forgive. And it also has the best uh, voice acting I've ever heard where you, when you return, you have a different body and yeah. each of the, that you're reanimated as a completely different person. And sometimes you'll have a uh, cough that makes stealth really difficult mm -hmm. because each of your bodies have various issues and problems. Mm -hmm. You might be too big now. You might be too small now. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually changes up the game, but it doesn't have the same kind of narrative complexity uh, as, as Returnal sounds like it does. Sounds like you're making a pitch for Void Bastards, Tanya. It's, it's just a cheaper <laughs> game. Uh, it's on the Switch, but yeah, right. yeah uh, that's, that's, yeah. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm worrying that point. Right. Right. Yeah. So these are the kinds of sort of debates that we often have, you know, when, you know, thinking about games and, and everyone's sort of comfort level with different types of game genres, right, and trying to work out some of these issues. And, and we'll talk a bit about how we get people on board of games that they might not initially feel that um, uh, they would want to um, uh, talk about in a podcast. Um, so the next thing we want to um, talk about is... Um, uh, you know, after a choice uh, has been made and an episode is in development um, and you're on the panel, um, how do you handle not not getting or not being able to progress in a game for which you've signed up? Um, so we've we've had this experience and so we have a number of sort of um, strategies for how we deal with that. Um, uh, Jeremy, did you want to start us off? Sure. So, I mean, and I think this again can be generalized to uh, you know any academic research because you know we're talking about hitting unexpected roadblocks. So, whatever topic you've selected, if the research isn't going the way you expected it to, and the narrative of whatever story you're trying to tell isn't shaping up the way you expected it to, first and foremost, be honest that that is that is your new topic. Is that I you know this was my hypothesis, and this is the way we were su surprised. Um, so for our niche topic, you know, it's important to let the listener understand like standards as far as things like finishing the full quote unquote game, like a, a reviewer at a media outlet that is giving a score that's going to be, you know, aggregated with Metacritic. They have an obligation maybe to see the full quote experience of a game although that is a harder and harder concept to define these days. But, you know, again, in these situations, those outlets, the podcast, whoever is responsible for it will usually kind of, their policy is usually an, or should be known. So for our podcast, I don't think we've ever made the claim that we are completionists or experts in, in video game playing. Um, and I've found like some of the situations where uh, I've found cases where acknowledging my own frustrations and roadblocks were, they helped me to articulate something deeper about the way a game was telling a story, which is what we're there for. Uh, and this is where we're at with the debate stage with, with Returnal, where it's like, I can't finish that game. I could potentially watch it, but I don't think that that's the kind of game where watching the story would have the same impact. 
Um, but we've played games, you know, our very first episode was uh, a very difficult on a very difficult puzzle game called The Witness that I felt that I had played and, and understood there's a breakthrough moment in that game. And I talk about it in that episode that happens before the end of it, before the technical end of it. And I, I feel confident saying I finished that game. I experienced what I was supposed to experience. And we talk about it in that episode, uh, a different game, a more recent um, card game, roguelike game called Inscription. I had a similar problem where I just reached a difficulty spike towards the end. In that case, I, I, I watched the narrative that I was missing through YouTube videos. And I, I became convinced that that was just as compelling a way to learn that story. There's a lot about conspiracy theory and deep diving kind of woven into the narrative of, of inscription. So even though I didn't get the story by playing the game, I got it by like diving through YouTube and finding communities. And I, I feel like that, that made sense. So again, all of this is to say, don't ever try to put the narrative you had in mind first, you know, don't be stuck with it. Be be ready to change and be honest with your listeners. Yeah. I mean, we all um we're all academics. We're all game academics. Um, we're all smart people. We know games. Um, you know, we're doing a podcast where we know games. I think like um I think there is a debate to be had about whether people reviewing a game need to have played the whole thing. Um, I think that's certainly not us. I think we are not alone. In the podcast, there's at least two other people talking, um, being honest, just like what Jeremy said, um, and like getting a sense of the game is good. And again, like witness, I I I am bad with puzzle games. <laughs> I was on the first episode, and I I tried to play it for a bit, kind of got the sense, and was like, I'm going to I'm going to watch a walkthrough. And I mean, like you know, walkthroughs are a lot of people watch walkthroughs um, or watch other people play games um i feel like you can speak to that <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and that's the one thing i wanted to impart to this team because as as academics we tend to be very um i don't know self-flagellating like really try the try hardiest and one of the things i can share with you as a per, as a gamers reviewer in the very like early early you know 90s i was uh and and this this is even more sophisticated today they uh, pr people um, you know, uh, the, the software teams, uh, the development teams that develop these games actually do a lot to nurse those games journalists along. You will get, you know, like those old game guides, you will literally, that's how I used to be supported by the companies that create these games. And it does create, a, I, I've talked about this, um, you know, in the, in the sector a lot, um, there's a real symbiotic relationship between like the the comms teams of those games developers and the journalists. The journalists are not in most in almost every case playing the game entirely through. I shared uh, with the team a stat that about 14% of all games even with die hard gamers uh, are completed, right? That's that's the real that's the realism of even the most um die hard gamers don't complete the games. It's a very very diminishingly small uh, a percentage and that you'll often find even in games that it, it looks a little half-baked near the end <laughs> or there's a difficulty spike and they haven't really balanced it that is because you know most people don't ever get to that end <laughs> right so it's really important to remember that and and that that performance gaming is performance that's how games journalists often deal with the inability to finish right they will watch you know, a professional demo person do it or walkthroughs are given to them or narratives are given to them. Um, so, you know, that's something we can sort of free ourselves from the guilt. And that that and that's, you know, as an early gamer back in the 80s, you maybe got 10 minutes of time with a game like it was, you know, and I felt sort of glutted and happy being a PC gamer later on when I got to spend hours with a game. But, you know, if we're being real traditionalists here, um, you're not getting to the end of that game. <laughs> so we, we we have a we have kind of found a way to kind of deal with that besides you know um walking playthroughs so, so chelsea what, what what do we usually try to do yeah so uh when i can't progress in the game or even like i don't fully get it i that can obviously feel challenging and embarrassing but uh, one of the ways to, I think, navigate this is by scripting contributions with other team members, clarifying your own thoughts through like dialogue or support from their perspective. So like 
if I'm struggling with a game's mechanics, but I understand its narrative elements well, I'll work closely with somebody who's more mechanically adept. Like if I'm not really good at the combat of one game, but I understand the other uh, elements of it, we can create a more comprehensive analysis that sort of blends our perspectives. And it gives me space to articulate my thoughts and create that structure, that conversation that others can build on. The tradition of gameplay in general is usually shared playthroughs, right? Taking turns, communal gaming sessions. Um, that's more of a cultural practice anyway in gaming, right? That broader collective approach. And so that I think situates our discussions within that framework anyway, right? Highlighting our diverse perspectives and contributing like to a more holistic understanding of what it is to be a gamer in itself, right? It helps us contextualize mechanics, aesthetics, and flow of a game and being attuned to what it actually is to play because the community is reflected in that experience of broader gaming culture, just engaging with each other through these playthroughs. Um, so scripting is more than a compensatory measure, right? It transforms discourse into that cohesive narrative, right? That reflects that collective experience. And so I think it's even important not to get certain things in a game and to allow your other members to take take that up. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, we we often, um, if we're in charge of, you know, writing the episode, we have a kind of enthusiasm to get deep into a game that maybe other team members don't want to. So, um, and we don't want to basically be the only person who's monologuing throughout the entire episode. So, you know, um, when you do that kind of work, you try to kind of share it out to you know other people um, on the team and I, and I don't think there's any problem with um you know doing that um because uh, it's really about you know how the episode as a whole hangs together um, so this kind of leads into our, our next question um and um which is you know how do we respectfully deal with differences of opinion about a game um or with differences about what kind of topics of discussion we should choose for an episode. Um, so, you know, we, we've we had a number of episodes where people have, you know, quite divergent uh, opinions on uh, on the game. And, um, um, and and we want this to be a kind of, you know, civil um, uh, conversation. So so how do we do that? How do we deal with that? Who wants to jump in? I just like to take this moment to formally apologize for suggesting uh, real mist the missed game. <laughs> this, this is my opportunity to 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 grovel and, and ask your forgiveness it was a it was a throwaway folks uh listening it was a throwaway remark i made about my father being obsessed with mist after he joined a spiritualist movement and uh everyone was like what a weird thing to say let's try to play mist and uh yeah it, it just I, I i signed us up for a, a, i think what three weeks of just hellishness um no disparagement of mist but it is a little it's a little inside it's a little it's a little and i did uh, i did weep openly at one point uh while i was playing it and uh I, this is just my chance live before you all to apologize to <laughs> yeah. the entire team of course the good thing about that episode is, is everyone shared the same opinion yeah. that mist was bad <laughs> though i i quite enjoyed my playthrough like i thought again like as i said in the episode like vibes wise it was next to none um but i was i was gonna say i mean like on on one end we both like each other. We respect each other. We're colleagues at the very least. Um, and and like we're not we're not out to be right, to be the 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 one who's right. We want to hear each other um, on that same end. We're being academics. We're pretty confident in our tastes. So like, you know, hearing Chelsea um you know, say she doesn't like racing games. Like I, you know, like that's, <laughs> I wouldn't have even registered that if you weren't like, sorry, Patrick, you know, like it's, it's one of those <laughs> things, me saying, I don't like strategy and puzzle and Jason being like, I love those. Like it's, it's kind of one of those things that just rolls off your back. It's like, I don't like that. Oh, I do like that. Like it kind of just, we're confident and we're respectful enough to each other that we're not, good. we're not out to hurt feelings. And I feel like we don't get our feelings hurt. Yeah, I can't think of a better like forum for this. I've like never feel disrespected at any point, right? Um, and because we're like a team composed of people with different views and experiences and knowledge bases, that broadens our scope for things to talk about and explore. Uh, and so we like enable and allow those new perspectives and that's part of it. Like that, that disagreement is part of what keeps it kind of fresh and new and encourages that critical engagement with things. And so I think it's even part of like, it's a pivotal role in creating like a more inclusive environment, even if it doesn't immediately seem like it. So 
um, just looking at it through what we might not consider otherwise, right? Like I, I say, I don't like racing in sports games, but I could probably be convinced to try it, right? Like, especially from my colleagues like this, um, I, I think that I could be convinced to try uh, that one that you mentioned, Tanya, I can't remember, the Disney snapshot one, right? So I, I, I think it's a good forum to even disagree um, because <laughs> people mm -hmm. are so able mm -hmm. to. I'm, yeah, I'm trying I remember. To... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tanya. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm trying to ruin the contents, uh, the comment section. Uh, it's <laughs> split second, but um, yeah, it's it, yeah, this this team because I've been on a lot of games podcasts. Um, this team is by far the nicest, <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm testing how nice you are by putting uh, Gran Turismo <laughs> is boring in the chat, and if for anyone on the, uh, you know, you can feel the gravel road, man. Um, that, that's. <laughs> Yeah. So sorry. Go ahead. That sounds great. That sounds great to me. Um, I yeah, think yeah. some credit should go to Jason for just choosing great people and somehow emitting the energy uh, the great people uh, gravitate towards. Yeah, I was I was just going to add, you know, um, I really like that. A uh, good example is the episode on inscription where I was getting really kind of rather um, uh, uh, critical about you know the game as it progressed right but chelsea brought a whole sort of domain of knowledge about you know card games um that really sort of changed my mind about you know how much you can get out of that game you know if you came at it with the right set of knowledge and practices and um and and uh, experiences right so so it's really great because you know even if you do like have you know strong feelings about um, a game um often someone else on the podcast can open up areas to you that you didn't know about before and, and really change your perspective on um uh, on the value of, uh, of a game that we're talking about Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. I feel like I just want to echo everybody's sentiments about this. Uh, again, I think we said when we were discussing this question and planning this, like we can't even imagine having a heated fight amongst ourselves for all of the reasons you've all just, just said. And I think those are all the most important reasons, Chelsea, especially just the aspects of, I mean, just in the spirit of inclusivity and just you should always be seeking there should never be a combative environment in, in any discussion. But uh, I'll also add just a, 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 as far as good podcasting, contrary to what anybody tells you, like a heated argument is not good entertainment, but also like rabid agreement is not good entertainment. So find that balance. You want to have differing opinions and you want to have respectful discussions about anything you're talking about because um, to skew in either direction uh, to the other side, you're going to lose listeners. And uh, I don't know. I hope although, I, although, although, although having a game where everyone really has a really strong hate on for it, it does make for a good episode. <laughs> that's, that's a, that pitch, that's a pitch for missed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go, go listen to our missed episode. Yeah, yeah. It was one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> so, we're, uh, we're a super uh, Canadian uh, podcast, though, <laughs> in that even even the, the critique is 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 quite measured and, and kind. Uh, and it's it's Jason Boyd's vortex of kindness. Uh because everyone is nice around mm -hmm. Jason. So. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. So um, to finish off, um, because this is um, a symposium on best practices, um, we wanted to try to generalize or universalize um, our experiences with the Playable Stories on Archive podcast um, into um, a set of, you know, um, uh, rules uh advice um that we can um you know provide um our listeners here so um so what best practices of advice to other podcasting teams can we offer um about choosing workable topics that will result in good episodes maintain a team's cohesion um and ensure the ongoing viability of a podcast so i think we've all got a a number of do's and don'ts that we we want you to take away and hopefully you'll find useful chelsea yeah so as we've talked about the importance of a diverse team right with a range of interests and perspectives uh in my experience one of the most essential best practices is this right so um because of the diversity of teams you can bring people from a broader array of talk topics to the table 
optimal. And so that ensures that the discussion is continually engaging. Variety is the spice of listening, right? It keeps the content interesting for both the audience and the team itself. So you can touch on multiple facets of a subject. You can make it more compelling and approachable. Um, also, absolutely propose topics that you are unsure about or tentative of. You'd be surprised at the level of interest in a topic by others on the team uh, and a dialogue about what topics are suitable for podcast is also a really good way to keep people engaged so often there's like a reluctance to bring up topics that might seem too niche or too controversial or too difficult to execute i play weird games i play really like weird horror games and really weird like esoteric things on the switch that i found for like a dollar but i've found that like these tentative suggestions can lead to the most like spirited and thoughtful discussions right sometimes what starts with like a hesitant idea i was really hesitant to name like um the one that i just was on the uh, dark pictures anthology mm -hmm. i've played them a lot and i've played them like with my friend and it's like our baby and so also having that uh idea of like people are going to criticize it can be tough right but mm -hmm. Because we're such a respectful team, right? Um, popping out their ideas doesn't just encourage like that open mindfulness, but uh, it helps people feel like empowered to contribute to these really interesting titles that people might not think about. So, so ultimately, kind of that blend of like cautious exploration but enthusiastic, I think, collaboration ensures that podcast even remains viable and exciting. Not every idea is going to become an episode, but every suggestion still contributes to that sort of collective growth and the adaptability of the podcast itself. Yeah, I was I was thrilled that you suggested the Dark Pictures anthologies because I also love those games. And like same Jeremy, when he suggested Returnal, I was like, yes, definitely. You know, those risky moves, you, you don't know that other people love them. Um, but to go back to a don't, and this is kind of uh, fortifying what Jeremy was talking about earlier. Don't be overly prescriptive when choosing the order of episodes. You know, well, the topic of certain episodes might require them to be recorded at certain times like we wanted the scary episode out for halloween we had the like uh summer conference that we wanted um we're hoping to do a, a valentine's day episode in february um generally let interests of the team play a role in what episodes get produced and when i mean we're all people with um you know other stuff on the go um it's important to have people who have time to play the games and um you know, who who are excited to play them. Excuse me. But also on that same thing, when choosing and scheduling episodes do spread out the labor. Uh, when a podcast is non, it's a non-monetized like ours um, with people, uh, you know, as has come up, as you all know, busy people with many projects on the go. It's good to be mindful of members' times, capacities, and resort, uh, <laughs> resources when assigning the roles of writer, host, producer, panelists. Um, typically, like right now, we have you know two editors, I think three editors now, maybe a fourth. Um, you know, uh, no nobody doing two roles at once, except for in like very some occasions. Some occasions, I was both host and producer. Um, but yeah, you know. Uh, it's good to have many people being able to wear many different hats. Yeah, and you know, don't rush into recording an episode when a topic has been chosen. I think it's important to um, to make sure what you want to say and that what you have to say is worth listening to. So it really does um, pay to really plan out an episode. Um, so for educational scholarly podcasts, particularly. Uh, do if you're the designated writer um, prepare a detailed script for a podcast episode while allowing panelists the choice to pre-script their own responses if they would like um, i think it just makes for a much better podcast if um, you have that you know well scripted um, before you start the recording yeah and um to pick up on that uh well actually to pick up on chelsea's point i feel like um not only should you not be afraid to put forward the the things you are an expert in that you know you feel like might not be as broadly known don't feel like you have to be an expert on something to to put it forward um i've learned so much just in in working on these episodes and so just know that you can put a topic forward and when work with the team and then it's a shared research endeavor uh where everyone can you know you come into it and you learn as you go 
if you wait, if, if you only talk about the things that you feel that you know everything about, you're not going to learn anything new. So put, go, go outside your comfort zone and, um, and have confidence that you can contribute to something that you're unsure of as well, I guess. So, to, you know, like if you see something nominated, if you're working within a team and there's a topic that you're, don't just tell yourself I'm out. I'm not, that's not my thing, or I'm not into that. Um, you may surprise, you may surprise yourself and being a panelist is a great learning opportunity as well. So, um, don't sell yourself short before you give yourself a chance, I guess. Oh, you're muted, Tanya. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen once. <laughs> Yeah, and just to pick up on that point and just furthering the theme of this is a really nice team, uh, we want to we do want to assure others on the team that we're going to support them if they choose an episode on a topic that they may feel is beyond their ability. And, you know, I'm just thinking here, uh, this is unique because, again, I've done a lot of podcasts. I, I focus more on the board game side of things. And it can be a, re a real um, blood sport in, in, in other fora. To, uh, to discuss games, and this is not that. This podcast is not that, and it's it's a real blessing. Uh, there was actually a meme the other day, which I'm going to share, uh, which is um, the difference between academia and a cult is with a cult, you have a sense of belonging. Uh, there are a lot of sharp <laughs> elbows in uh, in in academia, and, and again, this podcast is quite unique and a feeling of real, like there's a lot of you know sharing of responsibilities and things just kind of organically happening and nobody's trying to persuade fellow team members that they could be um you know that they're get, they're doing it wrong or they're not contributing um and letting them know that they can be part of most proposed episodes even if you can't get or you're stuck uh in a particular aspect of the game and that you know there's no bad ideas um, and that we, you know, have a list of proposed topics, uh, but no panelists and thus no episodes. It just, it's really fascinating to watch. And I'm quite new to this podcast, how people just spell each other and really pull it together. And, you know, again, uh, furthering my apology on the missed <laughs> suggestion, which was my weird throwaway remark. And everyone's like, why don't we do that? Um, <laughs> an offhand suggestion like mine which was weird uh can lead to choosing you know a topic uh that all panelists might actively dislike but we still had a pretty productive and fruitful discussion and it, it allowed me to relive some childhood trauma as well um and this can still be a like a really good episode and again sh shout out to our missed episode so mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, you know that missed episode was great because it basically showed that it doesn't all have to be um episodes on games that people like right you know there there are bad games that um you can talk about um in in really interesting ways right because you can learn something from bad games right so so that episode was was the proof of that so we've made really great time um and uh we're at 11.30, um, so we still have um, 15 minutes, um, and we'd be happy to um, hear any thoughts or questions or um, uh, other suggestions uh, for for best practices or experiences about choosing topics for episodes that um, uh, people um, in, in the audience have. Or what games you're playing right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, any suggestions for um, for uh, an archived podcast uh episodes that was a question i was thinking about asking you is is, <laughs> is there something mm -hmm. um that is on your mind that you'd like to uh you'd like to suggest maybe let's start with that with my, my question to you um as people get sort of warmed up um is is there sort of like a dream game that you would like to talk about that we haven't talked about already uh i can go Please. Horror. <laughs> I love horror, and I'm sorry, Jason. You can just not be on this one. <laughs> but... oh, oh, I just can't play horror. I can't yeah, play horror. yeah. <laughs> but I have a really big fascination with J-horror, particularly mm. like Silent Hill, Resident Evil series. Uh, there was a recent re-release of Silent Hill that I've been playing through, and I think just talking about that, even in relation to its initial release and the sort of culture of its release and J-horror in general, would I think be a really fruitful episode, and I would love yeah. to talk about mm -hmm. anything related to horror, but because uh, that's what my master's thesis was on, was horror games, and so I have a predisposition to love these, but yeah, just recently I've been playing the um, 
a Silent Hill remake. And there's just so many interesting little facets of it. Like sound plays a really important role in horror games more than others, I think, um, especially because I'll hear like the creature before I see it. And that mm -hmm. activates me, right? And then I'm like, I can't see it. Where is the creature? And then it turns out to be a crawling one and I'm not looking on the ground. And it's just, I think it's got a lot of potential for um, an episode. And again, I'm sorry, Jason. <laughs> that's a great answer. Yeah, that that's an episode I'd love to be on as well. <laughs> um, one I'm hoping we do. Uh, oh, sorry, Tanya, go ahead. No, I was just going to say Starfield because it would force oh, me yeah. to, to complete the game, which I have not yet done. And in particular, a really fascinating narrative just for me is the yeah. Ryujin uh, class, uh, where they're corporate uh, propagandists and, uh, you know, in industrial espionage folks. And I'm fascinated by that as a, as a commentary on where we are as a society. Anyway. Sorry, what is Starfield? Can you tell oh, me Starfield what kind is of game a, it is? It's a, it's a big triple A Bethesda game. It's um, oh. the folks who made Fallout. They did a, you know, essentially it's like a, it's, it's meant to be, I guess, Todd Howard loved Sundog, which is an old uh, space explor exploration game. And there's a lot of little aspects of Sundog kind of peppered throughout, but it's a space exploration game, but it's got elements of, of horror as well. There's a mm -hmm. lot of that. Um, it's it's just a you know it's one of those lifestyle games that I feel terrible I haven't been back to in a few months. Uh, that would give a great opportunity to talk about Bethesda games and like where they've come, where they are. The critical reaction to Starfield was wild. Yeah, totally, and I think undeserved, but that's another mm -hmm. controversial comment that we can angrily argue. <laughs> Jeremy or Jason? I was uh, there's one game that I've, I haven't played that I've been very intrigued by, but I'm just not sure whether or not it would fit within the scope of the Playable Stories uh, on Archive podcast, or whether you could actually get a full episode out of it. And that's Pools. Sorry, say again. Pools. P O O L S. Huh. Pools. Never heard yeah. of it. It's. From what I can tell, it's just you're walking in this very surreal pool like That's kind of horror, spa. Jason. It, it is it is horror, <laughs> but there's but they very explicitly say there's no monsters like this, but it's just this very, very uncanny um space that you explore that's just this kind of infinite Escher like yeah. kind of cool structure right yeah. i would endless, love to yeah, do endless this. endless tiled rooms and hallways and water what? and is water it, slides and is it like a back rooms kind of vibe yeah. it's, it's the same so, people yeah. it's the same team yeah. that developed that right um and it and it just it's so interesting because it's it, there's no story right it's just you wandering oh this space. looks cool and i'm just like I, I just think it would be so interesting to talk about that right but i'm just I'm hesitant about whether or not you know you could get a full episode um, out of that game, and, and if there's if you could even talk about that meaningfully as a as a story, right? And maybe that's why I'm kind of intrigued because yeah, you know, it, it is that kind of spatial exploration. I think this would be amazing. Story. I mm -hmm. would play this. I would play I, this for sure. I'm, like, I love wonder... liminal spaces. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. My wonder is this: is this too accessible? Because that's also a question with. Yes. on archive games because they're supposed to be less accessible um so like if you have one that's short easy exactly. to play um mm -hmm. there, there's that kind of juggle we have a question in the chat from milan uh just asking is it just uh endless tiled rooms and hallways yeah that's it yeah. that's the one <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh jeremy and, and subliminal oh, yeah by um yeah subliminal is another kind of one. Oh yeah yeah yeah, know. that's and that's that's a good question. But Patrick, you raise a good point about like I I sometimes do this too, right? I'm like, okay, is is this is this a playable stories archive game or is this an archive podcast mm -hmm. game, right? Because we want to kind of you know you know make sure that the podcast is really focused on those those games that we would, really wouldn't be suitable to teach like in a course right because we can't ask a student to you know fork, fork over 80 dollars or spend like 100 hours you know to kind of play the game right so so yeah so i'm not yeah so that's another issue about pools right is it although i can't imagine writing a playable stories archive entry about pools because right. you know what, what would one actually say <laughs> so go ahead jeremy oh that's okay and uh I, i'm 
I think the thing I'd put forward most, it's the one like big AAA kind of experience I've, I've found the time to do recently. Uh, and I think this would be a big, difficult episode, but I recently finished um, Alan Wake 2 and mm -hmm. all of its residual uh, downloadable content, which is now done. And it'd be yeah. hard to fit in because, I mean, honestly, what's fascinating about it, it's it's meta entertainment and meta writing on a very juvenile level, but because <laughs> Sam Lake and, and remedy, they do it. So he just, you know, he, it's, it, he's just not afraid to keep making it deeper and deeper. And so it is storytelling that expands beyond a medium on another level. Um, like if I could sum it up really quickly without spoiling like the new stuff that uh, happens at the end, Alan Wake 2 is a sequel to an old game, a 2010 game that was made by the people who made the original um, Max Payne shoot 'em up detective games. And man, I'll try not to get too deep, but in now jump fully ahead to now, they've made several games the studio has. They've all been written by Sam Lake, who um, runs the company Remedy. In Alan Wake 2, they use Sam Lake's character model as a person, yeah, I mean, it's all fully, you know, filmed and, and you know, you know CGI'd in, but the voice actor is the original Max Payne voice actor. And the character that Sam Lake's model is used for is this hard boiled detective who is really mad that there's a character with his same name in Alan Wake's books. It's levels of meta that I'm not going to even try to get into that gets annoying. Um, but there's just so much. It, it keeps you on your toes as, as you just never know whether he's referencing one of his other stories or the real world and the the directions that it went just when I thought it was kind of annoying, again, juvenile metal level storytelling. It did some fascinating, it made some really fascinating commentary about AI um, uh, authorship with the DLC that I'm still kind of processing. Yeah, this is, this is my latest, this is my pitch for an episode, but I don't even know that I could narrow it down to a single, uh, single episode, but Alan Wake 2 was fascinating. Mm. Um, and that's horror for Chelsea as well. It is quite scary. <laughs> a lot of these games that were just recommended have horror elements, which I, I'm here for. Even Pools. I'm sorry, Jason. It has a lot of horror <laughs> elements to it. And yeah, I love liminal spaces and found footage. And those are two of the selling points for this. So mm. I'm absolutely on board. Um, even if it's not just like Pools and it's an exploration of liminal games like Pools and Enemo and the Moiapolis, which is the other one I sent, which is very much yeah. like pools. Mm -hmm. Like I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of these grand strategy games, I'd be really interested in talking about, you know, I think I put down for Crusader Kings too, because I just love the, the sort of the, 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 the intrigue, um, you know, it's less about comment, most and more about like sort of, you know, intrigue, but it's such a lot sprawling, huge, complicated, um, you know, game and be really, I think, challenging to um, to get people on board to play that. Right. Um, I think we had we had a similar problem. It wasn't really a strategy game, but um, our episode on um, on uh, the Book of Travels. I think you know we realized that this was you know a long, slow game that required hours and hours and hours of you know investment, and it was just wow. Like even I think I played the most of everyone on the panel and I didn't even get to, you know, <laughs> through the supposedly the main story that you were supposed to get to in the prologue. So so that's um, those kinds of games can really be challenging. Yeah. There's a question from Milan. Sorry. OK. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Hi, everyone. I've. I've really enjoyed hearing this this discussion about your process. Um, and I wanted to say two things. First of all, um, if you ever have guests, I would love to discuss with you uh, games with plot twists. Um, so yeah. I'm coming from a literature background. Um, my first book is about the history of the plot twist in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, but I've also written a bit about twists in movies. I like to think about twists in games. Um, Several of the games you've already um, covered, I would argue, have twists. But um, anyway, that's a pitch for myself. But um, what I wanted to ask and, and kind of hear more about is like how 
other narrative media fit into the podcast medium, right? Like this is something that, so in my own podcast, How to Read, we've grappled with it. Like, how do you talk about a, a long work of literature in a 15 minute podcast episode? One thing we quickly learned is like close reading, which is the kind of default for literary scholars doesn't really work in a podcast. Um, plot summary has a certain kind of usefulness, but you don't want too much summary. Uh, you know, I'm just, I, I would love to hear your reflections on, you know, yeah, a narrative in a different medium that you're then kind of relaying in a podcast format. What are some of the strategies that you found that work for you? That is such a good question. I love your research focus. Holy cow, mm -hmm. that is so fascinating. That's, you know, uh, I'm trying to tell the story of a game and that's always a problem. When I started out doing like uh, game reviews, my impulse was to, uh, I don't know, like just like talk too much to narrative right and maybe share way too much and you have to kind of um like almost use a in my case like just a, a journalistic approach to it where it's you know sort of broader issues bigger thoughts and then winnowing down just a little bit and keeping it as as short and snappy and accessible as possible and what i've i've noticed just i love i'm going to check out your podcast cuz i'm this is a thing i'm really grappling with with students um is just attention spans and and just you know how to read uh, and how to interpret and how to analyze and I think that's a really uh, deficient skill set uh, right now. So trying to you know tr trying not to tell too much of the story of the game um, and just uh, short short sharp punchy compelling intriguing aspects of it. Uh, and Dr. Boyd does a really good job. Uh, Jason does a really great job with. Um, like kind of chunking things out in a way that like a, a, a set nar narrative structure for the podcast, which is not something I've ever had access to when I've done other podcasts. So it's really well organized this one. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I think we I think we often try to kind of get the synopsis or the scenario out of the way as quickly as possible so we can get on to talk about, you know, other things um, about the work than just what the story is telling us, right? And, I, and I'm and i sure you, uh, Milan, it's the same kind of idea, right? It's like, yeah, okay, summary has its place, but but there are other aspects of, you know, narrative and, you know, structure and construction and, you know, all these kinds of things that, you know, are more interesting to talk about um, than just what happened um, in terms of the narrative. So, so that's one thing we try to do. Like, I think we often pick games, not just because the story is interesting, but because the way it tells the story is interesting, right? And, and that's what we really want to dig into. And we, we haven't had many guests, but we are sort of mm -hmm. looking to, is, to branch out. So maybe we can share... This is an intriguing new, uh, new, new sort of development. <laughs> yeah, we can maybe share a contact uh, where mm -hmm. people can contact us to talk about collaborations. But I'm curious, Milan, did you have a game in mind? Because when you said plot twists and games, mm -hmm. I had... A couple games come up but i want to hear from you i mean so maybe to keep with the horror theme doki doki literature club i don't know who has played that but um that is an interesting sort of game that begins as a dating sim and then gets very very dark um and that in itself is not the twist but anyway that's that's uh, one that i've been interested in and might write about at some point um and then another one i was thinking about i think because of some of the earlier discussion about who likes puzzle games who doesn't um unpacking i don't know if anyone has played that but like i mean that's almost borderline non-narrative except that there's a kind of reveal towards the end that um i mean it's very open to interpretation i won't spoil it but uh but yeah i mean and when i look at your previous episodes like uh, you know, Undertale, Shadow of the Colossus. I haven't played Inscription, but my sense is that it has a twist or multiple twists. Mm -hmm. um, Near Automata, The Witness. I mean, you know, actually, you've picked a lot of twisty games. Yeah, I think yeah, unpacking, unpacking, oh, unpacking is going to be one of our um, upcoming playable stories archive entries. I was going to say it's such it's yeah, it's such a great game, but it's also very accessible. So we're happy that it can be in the actual archive and not unarchived. We have there has been talks about Doki Doki Literature Club, that's for sure. Um, 
<laughs> and I was also thinking of Last of Us. Those two games have mm. some plot twists as well, and I'm, uh, I'm are trying inaccessible. To, I'm trying to remember the name of. I can remember the writer, but I can't remember the name of the game. And it's a little bit. I mean, it's a. It turns like male centric, like war games on their head. So it does what it does. But Walt Williams' game, what's the Spec it's, Ops? The line. Thank you. Yeah, Spec yeah. Ops, where like there's some significant twists. It's very heart of darknessy. But early on, without spoiling much, it's like it's it is such a mindless like war shooter set in a nameless or fictional Middle East country. Mm-hmm. But the loading screens about you know not too far in, like maybe 10, 15 percent of the way of the game in, they start. You'll, if you're if you're paying attention, you'll start seeing the messages at the loading screen where it used to give advice and how to survive and just really game gamified kind of things. It starts saying things like, "Do you feel like a hero yet?" or "Are you proud of yourself?" Yeah. And it's um and then it it really like, it's a psychological twist. Uh, it's very cool. <laughs> Thanks so much. Any any other? questions we're we're just over our, our originally scheduled time but we did start 10 minutes late so um if anyone else has anything they wanted to say or suggest or ask please do well um i want to thank everyone for oh um for for you know, joining the um, 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 the uh, panel and uh, you know, hearing uh, hearing our thoughts about how to choose uh, topics or or games for a podcast. Um, and you know, please do uh, check us out on storiesandplay.com. You can find both the playable stories um, archive and the unarchived podcast there. And um, and 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 tune into our future episodes where we might have you know uh, Milan on as a uh, as a guest. <laughs> It's a great way for this uh, Humanities Podcasting Network to network people.